and thanks for everybody for having the strength and the courage and the patience to stay for the last lecture. I know it's not easy. Um, so I'll try to make it fun. So far, most of my lectures have been things that have been very well settled. As I mentioned yesterday, what I want to discuss now are things that are much more in the air. And they give you much more opportunity for doing things. So some of the things I'm going to say um, still require some, some thinking. And we don't understand the full picture, but it's something that's clearly consistent and interesting. So if you have any questions, either during the talk or after the talk, I'm more than happy to, to discuss it. All right. So we wanted to understand, in some specific example, the structure of the symmetries of a given theory. Um, the simplest example I could think of while preparing these lectures was n equal to 1, d equal to 7, s u n super yam mills. It's not because it's the simplest field theory that I can think of, it's because it has the simplest, probably, uh, string theory engineering I know. <coughs> we have seen uh, in the last few months, few years, that there's a lot of interesting structure, particularly in low dimensions. And what that translates when you start doing geometric engineering is the lot of possible geometries you can consider when you do geometric engineering and they behave in very interesting ways. So this is the simplest geometry because the engineering of this on so M theory, it's fairly simple. This is M theory on some manifold. So let's say this is on some manifold M7. And then we want to consider M theory on M7 times C2 mod 7. So we believe that these two systems are essentially describing the same physics, at low energies at least. And our challenge is to understand the things for field theory that we understand there in geometric language. This has, of course, uh, multiple uses. The one that got me interested in this kind of problems originally is that it's very easy to engineer quantum field theories in a string theory for which you cannot do the field theory analysis. In this case, we can do the field theory analysis, but that's very non-generic. And if you want to make any statements about how quantum field theories behave, I think it's really important to also consider the, the cases for which we don't have a Lagrangian description. A string theory makes generating examples for which we don't have Lagrangians very, very straightforward. Um, so I don't want to, you to get the impression that all I'm doing is complicating the problem and saying things that in theory. This is something that allows you to learn a quantum field theory once you know the techniques in simple examples. So let's try to learn how this behaves. <coughs> In the last lecture, I mentioned that this is a very simple theory. M theory, well, I'll never simple gravity. At least it's not, doesn't have many fields. It has the metric, it has a dilaton, sorry, a gravitino, and it has an antisymmetric three form field. And most of, of, of what I'm going to say is about the last field here, the antisymmetric three form field. One thing I didn't have time to mentioned yesterday, but it's crucial for my discussion, is that there are some solitons in this theory, which are supersymmetric, which we call brains. So in this case, we have an M2 brain. And the convention in string theory is a little bit funny. Whenever we say that we have a M2 or MP in general, or DP, that means that we have P space dimensions. So the space-time dimensions are one higher. So this is a three-dimensional object, three-dimensional object. In the string theory, it's a dynamical object, but I'm going to use it to engineer defects in my field theory by taking some appropriate limit. And the M2 has the property um, that it couples electrically to C3. So I'm, calling, I'm going to be calling this field uh, C3. What this means is that if you try to describe the dynamics of this object, you have to include the coupling, so the, the action for M2, wrapping some 3-manifold, uh, sigma 3, say. It's going to be some kinetic terms that will not matter. So these are kinetic terms. The important thing is that it has a coupling of the following form integral over sigma 3 of C3. 
That's why it means like couples electric. If you think of a photon, for example, and you put it in a path integral, you want to add to the path integral a coupling which is integral over the word line of A, there's a generalization to three forms. There's an equivalent way of describing that the particle couples electrically Without being too careful mathematically, let's think of putting this object in the path integral. Then I have something like e to the v square, integral of dc3, which d star dc3. So this is a coupling supergravity that describes the dynamics of, of the three form, as you saw. Nothing fancy here, but if I add a, a brain of this type with an m2, I get an additional coupling, which is 2 pi i integral over sigma 3 of c3. So I can write this in the following way. This is over the whole 11 dimensional space time. I call it m11. <coughs> and then I have uh, dc3, which is star dc3 plus 2 pi i integral over m11 of c3, which the Poincaré dual of sigma 3. Um, I wrote in terms of Poincaré duality. If you are not very familiar with this, just think of a delta function on sigma 3. So delta function will support on sigma 3. All right. And then this implies, it gives you some equations of motion that tell you that uh, if you integrate by part, d of a star dc3, up to constants, that will not matter for me, is uh, this Poincaré duality, or this delta function, on sigma 3. Okay, this is a standard statement, just reviewing for those who haven't seen it before. The use of this is if I have some m2 on some 3-manifold, and I surround it by some uh, four manifold here, which I just four. I link it, or whatever. Um, seven manifold. Uh, so let's call this S seven, for example, to be a sphere. And you integrate over this S seven the star of D three. You are going to get one because of this relation. Okay, the idea here is you use Stokes. You write this as integral over the interior of the ball of d star dc3. There's a delta function that picks up the, the brain. This may be more familiar. This is a usual statement that you have a particle which is charged. You can measure its presence by integrating the electrical field strand. So I'm going to, generate, I'm going to generalize this in a second, but that's sort of the basic intuition. Okay, so this is them too, and there's similarly another object, which is uh, important for us. There's an M5 frame. So this is a 6D object. Coupling magnetically to C3. That means that if I put an M5 here, and I try to integrate dc3, I get that. The generalization of a monopole in this higher dimensional <coughs> construction. Okay. Any questions? These are going to be my ingredients. I, uh, this is basically all the things that we understand properly <laughs> in theory. So if I'm going to solve this problem at all, uh, it better be phrased in terms of these objects. Okay. So remember that the things I wanted to solve in this case are what's the origin of the distinction between SUN and PSUN global form. Can I do that? And what's the origin of the background fields and the anomaly that involves the background fields? That's going to be the target of my lecture. I'm going to start by describing the origin of the difference between SUN and PSUN. 
Now, abstractly, what, it, what is this choice between SUN and PSUN? It's a choice of partition function for a theory that has the same local dynamics. You can have different theories with the same local dynamics that give you different partition functions because you're summing over different instanton sectors. Or maybe you're coupling to an SPT where summing over instanton sectors. What's the analog of that in the quantum gravity picture? I'm going to call this a choice of global form. Well, I'm putting my theory, uh, the quantum theory of gravity, in a space which is non-compact. So I have to choose boundary conditions and infinity. So making it uh, also, that making a choice of global form is the same thing as choosing boundary conditions at infinity. Whenever I try to define a path integral in a non-compact space, not just in quantum gravity, and in quantum field theory, to have a proper path integral, an actual path integral, I have to fix what happens at infinity. And what I will show is that there is a set of choices that you have to make in this, uh, in this boundary that reproduce the choices that you have in the field theory. Okay, so how does infinity look like? So in our example, uh, infinity So a special infinity here looks like M7 times S3 mod 7. So the compact directions are all along the um, C2 mod 7. And this is how uh, the space where I have to set boundary conditions look like. I'm going to, I'm going to call this N10. So N10 is this combination. <coughs> So I have to think how in string theory, uh, in this particular theory of supergravity, in this approximation, I choose boundary conditions on N10. And there's a naive choice that is often made in the literature that doesn't work here. Naively, we could try to set C3 equal to 0. So all the background fields to zero, uh, but as I will show now, but this is very subtle. And in particular, it's not canonical. So it's definitely a choice you can make, but there will be a trade-off that I will explain um, that you don't need to, uh, that tells you that there's no canonical choice. So this follows from work by, um, by Moore and Friedborn and Segal on flux non-commutativity. This is Moore. I'm going to review the argument. It's an argument uh, because uh, the argument will be a little bit subtle, but I don't want to, uh, you to lose track of the, of the target. The argument will tell us that choosing the boundary conditions for C3 involves choices. And these are choices that you cannot make unambiguously. There's no globally defined choice in there. Global in the space of theories. Um, so how does the argument go? And yeah, yeah, uh, sir. Mm. Does flux quantization of C three? Uh, well, C three is not 
quantized. C3 is like a connection, it's analogous to A in Maxwell theory. So it doesn't have any uh, quantization condition. You don't impose any quantization condition in that flux when you surround N5 brain with an S. Oh, sorry. Yes, here, yes, of course. Uh, here, if I have an M5, um, this has to be quantized. Yeah, it's a Dirac flux quantization. There's Dirac flux quantization, exactly. There's a, there's a version of Dirac flux quantization in this theory. It comes, basically, you can repeat the argument by Dirac yeah. with the charged particle and the monopole, yeah. where either of these plays the role of the charged particle and the other one plays the role of the monopole. But in theory, that is not exactly correct <coughs> no because there can be some yeah thank you um yeah you're right by degrees of freedom on the on the world volume of that object yeah you're right That's that choice of c3 equals zero i guess is the subtlety you are mentioned there uh no it's actually a little bit orthogonal so you're completely right that there is um some corrections to this formula so uh to these formulas as you say so, for example, you can generate um, M2 charge from curvature and background. So there's a correction term here that looks looks a bit like uh, R, which um, sorry. Uh, that comes from the terms I didn't write in the action. The question is: Is important to to um, to maintain that sort of this in your hand? No, no, no. The, the physics here is coming from from Maxwell theory. Uh, if I want to do the proper full analysis, I will have to worry about, as you say, there's some corrections here that ultimately come from the terms I didn't write, but I wrote in the last lecture, which were minus one six integral of C three, which G four, with G four and integral C3, which x8. If you um, this kind of argument with those terms incorporated, you get some extra contributions from here. And that means that you can get curvature, sorry, you can get charge from curvature and from flux. Uh, and that's okay, but it will not modify my argument in any meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah, I should say, uh, doing this properly, properly, uh, in a in sense of properly that Involves differential commodity and so on, as far as you know, it hasn't been. Yeah, so here I'm getting into it. Yeah. Are you going to say a little bit more about the, how to understand the duality, whether it's some. Ah, yeah, why these two things are sort of the same or equivalent? Yeah, yeah. And how should I think about it? Is it some kind of decoupling limit of the. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, I can give you a little sketch um, without all the technicalities. So take uh, n equal to 2. So that's C2 mod Z2. And that's a singularity. Um, that can be resolved. So there's a family of Calabria spaces, of which this is a limit at finite distance in modular space. And a generic member of this family looks like this. So you have here an S2. And then you have some normal direction. There are two directions. So for those of you who speak algebraic geometry, this is OP1 minus 2. It's not going to speak algebraic geometry, but this is what it is. It's basically a complex line over sphere. Okay. Another point is um, this, space, uh, this space admits a normalizable harmonic two form. So point one. There's a normalizable. Call it omega. In general, you have n minus one of this, and this one has the property that if you integrate omega over the s two here, you get one. Yeah. Um, so now you have the C three field in the supergravity. Oh, and as I say, this uh, harmonic two form you should think of as localized on, on this region. Okay. 
the more you contract it, the more localized it is. So you should think now of, of the C3 as being omega, which is a two form, which A, which is a one form. So from this picture, you see immediately that you get a theory which is U1, or in general, U1 to the n minus 1, from the normalizable two forms that appear in the geometry. The appears from the supergravity modes. There's a normalizable deformation in this region that's just there because of the geometry. So that's the U1. And in general, the Cartan subgroup of whichever group you have there. And then there's a, a step, step two, um, which is the non abelian sector. Yeah, sure, Come on. Please turn this off. Come on. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. If, if you cannot turn it off. Thank you. Turn it off, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I still have to explain how the, where the non abelian bosons are for the SUN theory. And those come from M2 brains in this case. So you think about an M2 that wraps this cycle. It gives you an effective particle, which again is localized around here, uh, whose mass, and this is perhaps not uh, completely surprising, if this is a solid tone, you wrap it in some cycle, the effective mass goes with the volume of the cycle. So when I go to a singular point, the, the solid tone becomes massless. So there's a massless in the... So then two is three dimensional, this is two dimensional, you end up getting a word line for a particle, one dimension left. So you get a one dimensional massless particle. And because remember that the uh, what was this? That this M2 was charged electrically under C3. This particle now is charged electrically under U1 in this Cartan algebra. So these are going to be the W bosons that reconstruct the non abelian structure. That's the, that's the basic picture. But somehow mm -hmm. the bulk fields, they decouple? Or? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That depends on the <laughs> precise configuration that you are studying. Uh, if you study the closely related version that uh, I think Sagar was discussing on Wednesday of type to be on this same geometry, then what you get is a theory which is conformal, for example, and there you can go in the deep IR and the gravity decouples completely. This is not a, a CFT in the IR, this becomes free in the IR. So here you are with a slightly coupled to gravity. It's not going to affect anything I say, you still have to define the partition function of this quantum field theory coupled to gravity, but there's no strict decoupling limit here, which is interesting. A strict decoupling limit, that's interesting. You have a CFT, it's very easy to get CFTs from this point of view. This is not one, but it's very easy. You have a CFT, then, then you can do a strict decoupling limit, and then you really have a CFT. CFT plus gravity, but they don't talk to each other. Yeah. Like maybe the complaints related to the double-sided double, double -sided arrow, because on the left-hand side, you still have... Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're completely right. Um, let me think which direction I should put there. <laughs> um, you can put one side in there. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to say which one is point. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, this one is contained yes. in this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as I said, for me, the most interesting version of these arguments happens for CFTs. And there, really, you have uh, the CFT plus the couple of gravity, so that's fine. You can easily subtract gravity. Yeah, very good. Any other questions? Um, right, so I was, I was going to explain why fluxes don't commute in this kind of setup. I'm basically following an argument that's in Friedman and Segal. It's a beautiful paper, so I encourage you to read. I'm just going to give you the, the very basic version of the argument. They, of course, go much farther. So take... What I'm going to call general is Maxwell theory. <coughs> so this is a theory of a p-form. <laughs> uh, 
in um, some number of dimensions I'm going to call d plus 1. So in this theory, I have an action, just as usual, just a Maxwell action, some d plus 1 dimensional manifold of the field strength. <coughs> And nothing else. So in doing this argument, I'm going to drop the chan Simons terms. I believe they don't matter for this argument, and every um, calculation I know indicates that this is true. If you make the following modification to the final result, I will tell you if you replace every time I say flux in the end by M2 or M5 plane. But I have no proof of, of this statement, so let me tell you about the things I can prove. Sorry, one question. Yeah. Is the adjective generalized only referring to a p-form, or is it generalized in some other direction? Ah, yeah, uh, good question. Um, I'm going to generalize it in the direction of p-form generalized. Okay. If you read their paper, they also generalize it in the direction of generalized cohomology theory. Okay. I'm going to take ordinary cohomology here. So these cryptic comments I am making out not being able to incorporate the Chern-Simons theory is because I don't have a good handle on which generalized cohomology theory so I use for describing M-theory. If I did, I could just run the machine and get the answer. Okay. So let's take a theory with this action. I want to quantize on a spatial slice. And Of course, I'm not going to do this. Um, quantizing this theory, maybe I have a chance, but quantizing string theory, I really don't have a chance. What I really want to do is uh, I want to understand, rather, the action of the flux measuring operators. in the Hilbert space. Okay. So there's some Hilbert space, and I want to understand how I measure fluxes on this Hilbert space of states. Here, this Hilbert space will be a Hilbert space of field configurations on my end. Okay, the one that's easiest to describe is the magnetic flux. So how do you measure magnetic flux? I'm going to measure it in the in the electric formulation of the theory. That means I'm going to express everything in terms of CP. Right? It's going to be a basic variable. <coughs> if you want, to, when I write later some sort of uh, wave functional, my x coordinate in which I'm expressing this wave functional is going to be CP and not the dual CP. So how do I measure magnetic flux in this language? This is the topological sector. in which CP lives. So more precisely, come back to the question before, um, assuming that I'm working in ordinary homology, is going to be the class of VCP inside HP plus 1 of my space. Actually, coming back to that question, yeah. does that also mean that you assume that N10 has no torsion? No. Okay. Actually, I want to take torsion in N10 for this to be interesting. Yeah. 
Very good. Any other questions? OK. Well, this is a little bit fuzzy in the sense that I know what I want to measure, but this is not quite a quantum operator. I can write in my theory. It's not something with, on which I act on a state, and I get an eigenvalue. Um, so assume that there's no torsion in N10. It's going to be an assumption for a second, <laughs> just to motivate the formula. Um, then what do I want to do? In this case, uh, this is easy. You have h p plus 1. It's just a free part. And in, par in particular, it's uh, uh, It has no torsional component. That's what it means. It's just free. Uh, so I can measure it. By integrating on p plus 1 dimensional manifolds. The following way. Uh, let's call this x p plus 1. The sector that I mean I can be determined by computing this integral x p plus 1 of dcp for all x p plus 1. So that's a bit more precisely what I want to do. I want to integrate over each possible cycle and see what I get. <coughs> this is still not a quantum operator. We're almost there. Uh, so I can build a flux measuring operator u alpha where this alpha is valued in u1 I'm going to call r mod z of some x this is just the exponential of e alpha integral x of dc now this is an operator this I can hit the state with and see what comes out Now, by Poincaré duality, um, this space where I want to measure things, this xp plus 1, which is p plus 1 homology of my space, so I'm calling n. This is the same as h d minus p minus 1 of n term with coefficients in z. This is Poincaré duality, as is what? I'm sure. I'm not sure. Uh, hopefully, most of you know what this is. If you don't, think of this object as a delta function that tells you about this cycle. Okay? Same thing I did before for the M2 brain. D is 10, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 10 is D, I also say, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right, yes. <laughs> um, and everywhere do that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. And, oh. No, no, no. no. Uh, you're right. I was trying to do it in general because it's general, but I should do it in general. Sorry. Can you clarify what it means to have no portion? In, in the oh, yeah. Um, Does that mean that the homology group doesn't have a portion part? That's exactly what I mean by that. I'll drop the other assumption in a second, but that's what I mean. Okay. So equivalently, I can view this operator as being parametrized by some, let me write in this sensitive way, some alpha <coughs> it can be written also as exponential of e integral over n d, mm -hmm. right? Of dcp, which alpha times uh, the Poincaré dual. Okay. 
Okay. And now this I view as an element of h d minus p minus one of n d sorry n minus p minus one of n d with u one coefficients. Now, there's a reason I did all this. And it's that once I think of this as an element of this type, let me just give it a name. It's called this phi. And remember that phi lives in this group. Then I have a u of phi. That's the right thing to think about. I'm going to call this uh, the magnetic flux. So I'm going to call it m. <coughs> so this is just a redefinition. Relabeling. So I'm telling you that, at least in the case that there's no torsion, I can construct these magnetic flux measuring operators as objects labeled by these homology groups with U1 coefficients. Okay. So now let me drop the assumption that there's no torsion. Let me uh, allow for torsion. Uh, and the nice statement, the reason I went through all this trouble, is that this still works when there's torsion. So that means that there's a perfect pairing. Pair ring. From H P plus one of my manifold um, and D with set coefficients and H d minus p minus 1 of my manifold with u1 coefficients going to uh, u1. Okay. So by doing the same maneuver, I can also detect all the torsional fluxes in, in the manifold. Perfect pairing, for those that don't know the word. Uh, perfect pairing means uh, that you can always realize any homomorphism that you like. Uh, by choosing an, an element here. In other words, there's always a way of detecting any flux by picking a suitable element in here. Any questions? Okay. So if you go through the algebraic topology here, I'm not going to do that during the lecture, you will see that the free part naturally fits in the way I just mentioned. And also the Torsional part is detected basically by computing holonomies of the field, as you might imagine. So there's some exact sequences that tell you this group is composed of free part plus torsional part, and the torsional bit is precisely detecting the holonomy of the field. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about the magnetic fluxes. Any questions? Yeah, so because I think the whole process works with or without torsion. Why do you assume there is no and then you say it works? Ah, yeah, yeah, because some of the formulas I wrote in, in this way didn't make sense if there was torsion. Some of the isomorphisms were not true. I cannot always uh, represent some, I cannot always measure some flux uh, by, by integrating against the differential form, which is what I'm doing here. Yeah, I also have questions on the uh, coefficients of that uh, pairing. Yeah. Because usually I would expect that this pairing goes to uh, HD, right? HD of ND uh, with coefficient in U1 tensor Z and the yeah. tensor is taking over Z. But you are assuming that ND is oriented. So presumably the HD of ND is Z. Yeah. And But then on the right hand side would be U1 tensor Z. Yes, over the integers, so that's u1. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, Any other questions? Okay, very good. Um, let's go to electric flux, which happens to be the more subtle one. This is fairly straightforward. It requires a little bit of algebraic topology, but uh, we got a very neat answer. That we have a set of magnetic operators parameterized by objects in here. And the way they measure the flux is essentially by the same thing, but with cup products. 
Yep. Could you use the, the formalization of Jagger and Simon of differential cohomology to, yeah. to reformulate this and keep track of torsion and all the information in the cohomology groups? That's correct. Yes. Um, if you go to the original paper by uh, Friedmuller and Segal, they will do it for any generalized commodity theory. There's a uh, generalization for any generalized commodity theory of the Chigger Simons formalism that they review in that paper. Uh, so that's the right formation for doing it in general. So completely correct. I'm giving the absolute baby version here. <laughs> I have some non-competitivity of boards here. <laughs> this is not a... Yeah, it's not a... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So electric charge. I want to measure electric charge, and uh, same as before, it's not enough to just say I want to measure it. I have to construct an operator that does measure it. So just think for a second. The starting observation is that uh, the thing that measures electric charge locally the integral of DCP is canonically conjugate. To CP. So you think of this as position, this is going to be momentum. And then you can see from the action, right? We saw that the action was something like CP watch D star DCP. So you think of this as x, you have an action which is x wedge dp, as usual. So you can identify which one is which. This implies that the state of definite charge electric charge is an eigenstate of translation. That is, if I think of my wave functional, the pension C3, and I translate it. If I pick up a phase, which I'm going to write like this, Q electric, which lambda, then this is a state of definite momentum. Think of this, of think of C3 as X, and I'm saying that if I want to detect if something <coughs> is an eigenstate of momentum, what I can do is shift the position. If I pick a pure phase, it means I have a, something like e to the ipx, and that's an eigenstate of uh, position. So a moment. <coughs> so that's how you define charge, but this is a bit of a local definition. To get a measurement. That depends only on um, sorry. It depends only on the cohomology class of the charge, which is an element 
of n d with integral coefficients of degree uh, d minus p. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an element of degree d minus p. Then you can restrict. Or you should restrict. To flat lambda. To flat connections. Okay, so this was perhaps a little bit quick. Uh, let me try to unpack what I just said. Hopefully, this is clear. This is how you measure the momentum by translation. So, my operator is going to act on the wave function by shifting the coordinate and see what happens. That's the definition. The way uh, I shift depends on some connection, how much I shift the connection C3. And if this is an eigenstate, I'm going to pick up a phase, which is lambda, I think I shifted, times QE, which is the local charge density, as you saw. So if my conventions are right, this is a star DCP. Okay. I don't want to see the charge density locally. I don't want to see how much charge there is at the given point in space-time. I want to see what's the total charge in my space-time as a cohomology class. And for doing that, I restrict to lambdas which are flat. Why do I do that? Well, if you send QE to... Well, QE is closed by Maxwell's equations. But it's also independent of exact shifts. So if I do this plus alpha, you get that the integral over ND of... QE which lambda goes to integral over nd of QE which lambda plus the alpha. And of course, integrating by sorry, QE plus the alpha. And of course, integrating by parts. If this is flat, you don't modify what you have measured. Okay, so if you want to pick up only the commodity class, you can shift by flat uh, connections. So where do the flag connections live? <coughs> On and B living H P uh, of your manifold with U one coefficients. Um, why is this true? Well, the fact that it's flat, it means that it defines some sort of uh, cycle. So its derivative is zero. And the only information that I want to extract out of this is the gauge invariant part. The part won't affect this integral. So this defines a homology theory, basically. The fact that it takes values in U1, you should think of as this being the same as the homomorphisms from HP of ND with set coefficients to U1. What can you do with the connection? You can integrate it over P cycles and get a phase. That's what this is saying. So this isomorphism here is the universal coefficient here in this particular case. Okay. So the operator E um, I'm calling this. that acts on the wave function like this. I change the name of lambda to phi for some reason. Um, this is the electric charge operator. Bless you. All right. So I am where I wanted to be, which is I have defined what measuring electric charge means and what the measuring magnetic charge means. And now I'm going to argue that they don't commute. These two operators don't commute. Remember, that's what I wanted to establish. I wanted to say, well, it's not natural to just say C3 is equal to 0. 
this is going to be translated in the statement that it's not natural to say that the electric bits of C3 vanish or the magnetic bits of C3 vanish, you have to make a choice. You cannot impose both at the same time. Um, so these operators can fail to commute. If there are flat topologically Non trivial connections. That is torsion. Okay. What's the idea here? In measuring electric charge, I'm going to shift the connection. If that shift lands me in a new topological sector that's going to be detected by a magnetic operator, if I first measure electric and then magnetic, it's not going to give me the same thing as first electric and then magnetic. The phase. The commutation relation you unpack these shifts and these integrals, you get something fairly natural. Uh, commutation relation is the following electric forgot commutation relation. So this is the commutation relation. Maybe I should write beta phi. And beta is a map. Um, I'm going to give you an operational way of computing this, so don't worry, but I'm going to give you the definition first. Beta is a map that goes from uh, where this thing was living. Let's see, this was the magnetic one. So, ah, in general, sorry, the general definition. It goes from some homology group with U1 coefficients. To a homology group in one degree higher, so commonly in one degree higher. With integral coefficients. Associated to the following short exact sequence, Z R U1. So many of you might know this as the box thing. In some specific examples, it's the same. <coughs> yeah. Presumably, this statement is the same that this, there's electric and magnetic deform symmetries and they have a definite phenomenon. Yeah, it's related to that. Mm. Um, but is it? Because the next normally also appears in non torsion backgrounds, whereas this. Yeah, so uh, I was just going to lower it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, with, with Sagar, uh, we just wrote a paper uh, earlier this year where we compute these kind of torsional phases by going to the bulk, where the dynamical theory in the bulk is the anomaly theory. And, and by looking at that, you can reproduce these phases. Yeah. But as you're saying, it's not entirely me. You have to do a little bit of work. But it is related. It's definitely the same ballpark. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. Um, so here I told you what uh, this box ten, the definition of the box ten. But in practice, you are going to want to compute this. So perhaps a better way of writing this expression that's easier to compute is as the linking pairing. Uh, sorry, maybe, maybe before I go into that. Uh, let me give you a way of thinking of these objects. So these are both, in some sense, connections in bundles of some degree. If you follow my proof, that's what they were, right? One of them was a shift. The electric one was just literally a connection. 
and the other one was some object in, in a group like this one that I was using to measure flux, but whatever lives in here can also be interpreted as a flat connection. This is an isomorphism. So I have some sort of product of two connections, and if you want to think of this intuitively, you can think of this as some sort of uh, chance I must have. So very roughly, this is of the form B watch TC. This is slightly incorrect because my connections are flat. So my B is, sorry, the D act in a connection will give me zero. And my connections are topologically non-trivia. So B doesn't really make a lot of sense. But this is sort of spiritually a chance I use. There's also a different way of looking at this, which is very useful in practice. Um, you can think of the linking pairing between the box chain for phi and the box chain for phi. Um, so I need to define what the linking pairing is here. It's something that goes from HP of your manifold with set coefficients and HD minus P plus one with manifold to U1. Which is defined in the following way uh, after Poincare dualizing. So there's a definition in terms of cup products and so on, but I find the homology definition more intuitive, so that's the one I'm going to give you. Uh, this is a pairing that I can also define uh, at the level of uh, Poincare duality, the tilde. This is just Poincare dual between HP of ND, HQ, say, ND set, and HD minus Q minus 1 of ND to set, V1. Okay, so the relation between these two things is just to Poincare duality, right? Whenever I'm going to say intersection, imagine Poincare duality and top product. Yeah. yeah, I think just goes to Z. It's the expressionality that goes to U1. No, the linking pairing only goes. Ah, sorry, thank you, thank you. No, you, you sorry, I forgot one thing. Uh, this is between the torsional parts of these groups. So the, the pairing you're thinking is Poincaré intersection pairing. In that case, the degrees add up to the total degree of my manifold. Notice that here they add up to one plus the higher. Yeah. So it couldn't have been the one I wrote without the torsion. Here everything is torsion. Minus B plus one. Is it worth fixing maybe? I think it's HP plus one and HD minus P for the application you have in mind. Ah, um, I could do that. Yeah, sorry, my P wasn't intended yeah, to be that P. Right? But thank you. Yeah, let's, let's do that because it's probably better. Um, then here it would be D minus P. I, I think because uh, the phi of magnetic was in HD minus P. Minus yeah, one. you're you're correct. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and then Q is whatever makes this point gradual too. So in these conventions, it's fairly easy. It's just D minus P minus. Yeah, but then I would have problem with the expansion rate. The expansion rate some. Mm. U1. Yeah, so this is exponential of two pi i times something in U1. Okay. And sorry, when I say U1, I'm, I'm using physics language. I have my R motor. So I need to group more the integers. At a group of real small integers. And another thing you need to know to make sure this is well defined the box stain always lands you in torsion. Yeah. yeah. Is that actually rational? Two months. Eh? Oh, yes, thank you. I, I'm, in a second, I'm going to prove that it's rational. But you're right, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I could have written Q mods at that. Just as, mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so how do I define this one? For me, this is the most intuitive one. There's a very parallel definition to this one. 
OK, so say that you have, you want to compute the linking pairing of A and B. And because these are torsional, that means that there is some n such that n A is the boundary of some C. That's what boundary, so that the torsional means. And here n is, of course, an integer. So there's some integer where this holds. And then this linking pairing is defined very simply. It's just the ordinary intersection with signs uh, b divided by n and everything modulo. So in practice, this is not hard. If you want to do a little exercise to make sure you understand this definition, uh, compute the linking pairing between some t's, you're going to get one half for t a generator of h1 of s3 mod set. Okay, this is something you can sit down and do. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be here until five-ish. <laughs> If not, you can send me an email or something. But yeah, it's a little exercise to make sure you understand all the definitions here. OK. As usual, my goal here is not to overwhelm you with technicalities. It's to show you that all these things are computable in the end. Right? We have a hand on the geometry, and we know how to do all these things. Yeah. Yeah. In the dual version mm -hmm. with the cohomology, if I take the cap product between the two, I am like in d plus 1. Mm -hmm. So it should be 0. I mean. There is some, how I can imagine this? Uh... Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, in that, you instead of the boundary, you want to use the box chain instead. So in that case, you're going to sort of reduce to this definition. Yeah, so that's, to me, less illuminating. It's in some sense more physical, because that's where I came from. But this one is easier for me to picture in my head. Okay, so that was everything I want to say about flux and commutativity. This is the most important formula here. In the non-commutativity of flux, electric and magnetic is given by some chern simons that can be non-vanishing. I have to do a calculation to see if it's non-vanishing or not, if my ND has torsion. The requirement that ND can, has torsion comes from the fact that there's a box thing here. And the box then is non trivial only if there's torsion. Sorry, can you repeat the last thing you, you said when the box then is non trivial? Ah, yeah. Um, sorry, I was, I was sort of repeating what I said before about the, um, the linking pairing. Why is the linking pairing going from torsion to torsion? Uh, that's because the, um, uh, it involves some box stains. And if you look at the definition of, of the box stain there, it goes from, uh, you know, it jumps from the U1 to the set. If there's no torsion, that map here is going to be uh, free of kernels. So the box stain you can prove in that case is, is trivial. Just, just follow the uh, exact sequence. So let's check if our manifold has torsion. Uh, so generically, our configuration, well, generically no, in this particular case. So let's assume that we has no torsion. Then uh, M7 times S3 mod Zn has to. So 
which is not true generically when this one has torsion, but the computation is not as neat as the one I want to present. So by the Kinnett formula, <coughs> if I want to compute h uh, some degree, q, say, of this product, coefficient set. This is some where uh, R and S are into Q of HR of M7. And the assumption that uh, M7 has no torsion has come in, in being able to write this formula. If there's torsion, I have to write something more complicated, and I didn't, I didn't want to. Uh, for understanding the physics, this is enough. Although I should say, I suspect there is some interesting physics hiding in the case in which M7 has torsion. And to my knowledge, nobody has really worked them out. So if you want a little problem to start playing with these things, that could be a, a nice one. In the case that M7 has no torsion, then this is uh, simple decomposition. And then all you need to know is the um, homology groups of, of this lens space. These things are called lens spaces. Like this, maybe. So this one has torsion in one of its degrees. And this one is going to be a bunch of sets because it has no torsion. So this one is going to end up with some sets times set ends. It's going to end up with some torsion. OK. So, so far, we have learned that the fluxes, electric and magnetic fluxes in our M theory background, cannot both be simultaneously set to zero. What I'm going to do next is to connect this to the field theory. And for that, I have to give you an identification of what these fluxes are in the supergravity in terms of field theory quantities. So that's the next part of the dictionary. Uh, so let's start by describing the charge defects. So when I was answering Max's question before, I mentioned that the, the effective mass or tension of this object in of the brain in supergravity was with the volume of the brain. If I want to introduce a defect in the field theory, something which is completely rigid, something I put in the path integral and see how the theory reacts, then I want to uh, consider objects of infinite size. So defects. are going to be associated with non-compact pairs. Sir, can I ask a question on the previous thing about the, the generalized matching thing? Yeah. Uh, so what are we supposed to do now that, that we know that the, 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 the flux is done commute? So typically when we quantize some generalized Maxwell, um, we demand direct quantization, then we, we build the Hilbert trace over it. Now, what's the, the, the procedure that we're supposed to follow? Locally, you're going to do the same thing as you did before. But when it comes to splitting the Hilbert space into sectors, you're not going to be able to split it into sectors of definite magnetic and electric charge. So you pick your favorite generator, E, say. You can diagonalize the action of this generator in the Hilbert space. And then you can write uh, any of these states as a sum of eigenvalues of n. But it's not going to be diagonal, typically. Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, for, for those that um, haven't thought about this before, a useful way of thinking about this sort of stuff is well, this is Heisenberg algebra. Think of it as x and p, or exponentiated version of x and p. What I'm saying, really, is that x and p don't commute, and you're going to have eigenfunctions that have x and p as coordinates. You can pick the x's and go to a position representation of a state, or p's and you go to a momentum representation of a state. 
So that's all I'm saying. Um, you can pick a concrete electric flux, that's like being with a specific position, or you can put a magnetic uh, flux and there's a specific momentum, but you can specify both. That's over constraining your wave function. <coughs> Maybe I missed it, but the, does the M theory, does Anna's term play any role here? Yeah, um, I expect so, uh, but I, 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 no, I haven't done it, and I'm not aware of anybody else having done it yet. I haven't, so I haven't done it myself, and I'm not aware of anybody having done the full calculation. But I can tell you my expectation by from looking to other examples. Um, so those chan simons terms are going to be important, I think. In, in making the following statement true that happens in every other example and has also physical origins, which is these operators acting in the Hilbert space in the actual quantum gravity are not going to be defect operators that you can put in strength theory, nothing like that. They're going to be brains. And brains typically have more volume structure. They have worse in terms and so on. So I believe that, and there's some uh, nice works, this has been recorded, there's some nice works by Ibu Ba and collaborators where they make this intuition a bit more precise. Um, you think of the brain as really the thing that generates this symmetry. Then you want to represent the whole structure of the brain. I think those were the chain simons come. It's fairly involved and it's particularly involved for the M brains on M theory. That's why I skipped that bit in here. And in some sense, it's not just. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just mention. Uh, in some sense, it's not just sitting down and doing a calculation. Part of the problem is we don't know which calculation to make. In cases where we understand this structure at the level of generalized uh, cohomology, we can sort of have prescription, DNA prescription. But for M theory, we are not quite there yet. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so what are the non-compact objects? So defects. And there's sort of two that are natural here. Let me see if I can draw this. So imagine that you have M7 times C2 mod Zn here. And You can look at uh, the base of the cone here. That's the lens space I've been talking about. And if you compute the homology groups, the things that you can wrap, uh, which are torsional, it's natural to think about torsional things because those are the ones that will couple to torsional backgrounds. If you compute the homology groups of this thing, you get the Poincaré duals of the one I just erased. So this is said. So then zero set. So you see that there's a torsional one cycle. This is going to be the start of this row. There's going to be some one cycle here. I cannot draw it very well, so I'm just going to draw a point. Right. This point is supposed to stand for, for a, the non-trivial cycle in H1, but I run out of dimension. And now what you can do is sort of trace this point all the way to a singularity, so along the cone. This defines a two cycle, which is non-compact. All right. Um, this is defined. up to compact cycles living at the singularity. So just by doing this prescription, I don't really know what's happening at the origin. I could add copies of this uh, cycle as I want. It's still a two cycle. That's not going to affect my discussion. So um, there's a technical way of doing this, but let me just say this is defined up to that. This is an uncompact with this thing that matters. Yeah, let me just set it. 
Okay, so let me call this uh, I know, sigma. And I can see what happens if I put my two brains on sigma. So one of the ones I have is m2 on sigma. Remember that the m2s are three-dimensional. If I put a three-dimensional object wrapping this two-dimensional curve, I still have a one-dimensional curve left. So let's say I'm sigma times gamma 1. Effectively, my field theory that lives here This gives a line defect on the field. Okay. Um, when I went through the basics of this field theory yesterday, uh, there was a line defect. There was a Wilson line. So we can identify this with the Wilson line on gamma. At this level, this is a bit of a guess. There's, of course, better ways to motivate this, but I have 10 minutes. So How does it couple to the scalars? To the scalars? Yeah. Um, sorry, which scalars? You have three scalars in those parameters. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll have to think, I'm sure. In fact, this. Identification is not entirely ambiguity free. I'm defining this thing up to thing that's dynamical. And that means combining with these states here. But so that, that means up to hydro representation. Exactly. It means up to screening effectively. Yeah. yeah. Talking about fundamental. Yeah. So what I will need to do is take this state, construct a specific representation in that resolve geometry and see how it couples. And it seems to be I don't think anybody has done the calculation. And I certainly don't know off the top of my head. Is it super symmetric? Yeah, I want it to be super symmetric. Yes. Um, <coughs> yeah, that, you're completely right. I sh they should appear, and that's probably determined. But if you ask me how to derive that from first principle, I don't think I can do it on the spot. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, Maybe we can talk later. I don't think I can do it on the spot. All right, and then we have the other brain, the M5, on the same curve. Now the M5 is six dimensional, so this leaves a four dimensional object in the field theory. Um, uh, let me call it uh, sigma. This is a four surface. And this gives a four surface. In the fifth theory, and I'm going to identify this with a top line wrapped on this surface, atop the surface. So the way I would, I would do this, the uh, coupling to the scalars, would be to reduce to type 2a, uh, to take this locality I'm not. And then you have the configuration of an f1 ending on a d6. And there I think it's doable, probably has been done. Yeah, I think it couples to one of the three scalars yeah. to preserve a u1 symmetry, and that's that the u1 r symmetry is coming from the translation of gamma. From the yeah, that, that, that all sounds right, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I don't I don't know if it has been done in M theory, but I'm pretty sure it's doable even with the worksheet after reduction. Yeah. Okay, so let me just state that this is the right object. Certainly, we don't know of anything else in the field theory that could be, and there's other checks you can do that convince you that this is the case. And if these are the defects, then we can immediately identify the supergravity fields, the backgrounds with field theory backgrounds. So what's the idea here? 
So pick the flat connection. T in H1 of S3 set M with U1 coefficients. So one of these flat connections I was talking about before. And write C3 as B2 cap T and C6 as uh, C5 cap T. And here I'm assuming that uh, B2 and C5 are trivial on, or constant if you want, on a uh, stream of okay, So I'm basically doing some sort of KK reduction, just to get a feeling for the physics here. Now, we have that the M2 couples electrically to C3 and the M5 couples electrically to C6. That means that the Wilson line couples electrically to B2 and the Atoft line, uh, for surface, couples electrically to C5. So from here, immediately, just by knowing that this is 3 and C6 are the things that couple to M2 and M5, if that's the right assignment in the field theory, this implies that B2 is uh, an electric background. And C C5 is a magnetic background. So C3 and C6 aren't flat, right? They are not necessarily flat in, in the bulk, but I'm studying the asymptotic behavior. Anything that's not flat is going to contribute an infinite amount of energy. I really want to see what happens at infinity. So the coupling doesn't depend on how you extend the cup from, from cohomology to... No, no, no exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in seeing in boundary conditions, I want to restrict myself to flat conditions. And then, as you say, everything's fine. So at the beginning, you said that uh, the the charges of the M2 and M5 brains also get some contributions from the curvature. So does that not matter for this argument? Uh, in general, I think it will. Um, it's an excellent question. In general, I think it, it will. Here, my example is small enough that my P1s and my P2s and so on are not going to really care. Um, but you're completely right. If I was trying to make a general statement and not just about this particular theory, I should worry about that. Yeah. Is there a picture for the functor to all of So there's presumably some topological operator. Oh, yeah, very good. The, the symmetry in editors, basically. Yeah. Um, yes, you can do that. <coughs> and, uh, and the nice thing about this thing theory is that there's nothing you can do with, apart from what you have in, at hand. So there are going to be M5s and M2s wrapping on the torsional cycle. So basically the thing that's going to uh, generate your electric symmetry uh, is going to be an M2, if I'm not mistaken, wrapping the torsional cycle. No, sorry, it's going to be an M5 wrapping, uh, I don't know if I gave it a name, T was the Poincaredu. Uh, the generator of the CN. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, so that's a one form symmetry. You want uh, defects in seven dimensions, which are five dimensional. If you start with a M5, which is six dimensional, wrap it on a on distortional cycle, it gives you something that now is not non compact. Now it's really something that uh, looks more like a, like a line here, see? And now you push that to the boundary, and that becomes the symmetry generator. And similarly for this one, the M2 is going to do the job. That's something I, I won't have time to explain. Um, not even close, but if you want to reproduce non-invertibles, for example, in here, that's going to be very important. The fact that brains are interesting, they have more volume field theories, is, uh, is the thing that can reproduce the, 
Uh, you have seen non-invertibles in this school, right? And one of the things that makes non-invertibles non-invertibles is that they have a field theory on them. You dress them with some uh, phase. So when, when you collide them, you get something interesting, a condensation or whatnot. Brains, there's something interesting that lives on them is the field theory on the brain. We are still, another interesting project, uh, we are still in the infants of, of this kind of thing. We have done a few examples, it seems to work, that seems to be true. But uh, more complete examples we don't know how to do. Okay. So at this stage, uh, here I was a little bit quick because of time constraints, but you can motivate this better. But once you sort of believe this, accept this, um, then it's clear the physical interpretation of this Fried Witter, sorry, Fried Muran Segal um, flux non commutativity. The fact that I cannot put these fluxes to zero at the same time that I put these fluxes to zero means I have to choose to fix the B2 backgrounds or fix the C5 backgrounds. That is, I have to choose if I'm in the theory in which the B2 as a background can turn on, the Dirichlet background, that's the SUN theory, or if I'm in the theory in which I can turn on the C5 as a Dirichlet background, but then I have to sum over pictures. So that's the usual dichotomy that you have. The string theory is just repeating what free theory is doing, but now from a language that you can apply for non-Lagrangian uh, non theories also. Okay, so in my last... Uh, Do you have a counterpart of the discrete set angle? A discrete set angle in this theory? Um, not on the spot. I was thinking about this while I was preparing the lecture. There's a couple of fields I haven't described, and maybe one of these. But that's the kind of thing I need to sit down with you and talk. Yeah. In, in this theory, uh, in seven dimensions, if you're looking at the discrete set angle as in the thing that goes in four dimensions with. Uh, uh, you know, the SBT you can couple to. Here it's harder because you're in seven dimensions and the standard invariant is not there. Okay. Let me mention one thing perhaps to answer the question in a positive way. If I do this kind of exercise in four dimensions, uh, where I know I have all these structure fit angles, as in Harry Seber and Tachikawa, the supergravity answer completely reproduces their structure. So that, that, that's done already? That's done, yeah. That's not the first thing we did. <laughs> okay. So in my last uh, five minutes or so, I want to reproduce the anomaly. It's not going to be too difficult. I basically built all the technology that I need. So let me try to reproduce the anomaly, which remember in this theory looked like uh, the anomaly theory, looked like the integral of d gamma 3 cap the instant turn number that depended on my electric path. That was my anomaly theory here. The idea here, of course, is if you put a, a background for the one volt symmetry, the instant turns can, fraction, can have fractional charge, and then that's picked up by the instant turn symmetry. So how do I obtain this from that? So in, I, I chose a very specific form for the C3 in there, but that's of course the non, non, sorry, that's not the most generic thing I can do. Uh, so expand a bit more generally. C3 as gamma 3 plus the bit I wrote there, P2 cap T. And now Gamma 3 here is trivial or constant along the S3 mod 7. So people for more mathematically oriented, what I mean by trivial here, I mean pullback under the trivial forgetful maps. Um, so you have this kind of uh, decomposition. They have more terms, of course, but these are the ones that are going to give you anomaly. And expand. Uh, the, the term in M theory, which was one sixth of C3, which G4, which G4. 
Now here I have to be a little bit careful. This term as written has the same issues as the Chen Simons I was writing before, A which DA. Most things here are flat, so the D is going to kill them. When I write DC3 to write G4, the D is going to kill them, and this thing is not globally defined. So I have to be a little bit careful. And the right framework here is well, one right framework is uh, differential cohomology, for example. So this is something that uh, we did in a, in a paper with uh, um, friends. So if you want to see the calculation, it's not some particularly bad, but you need a little bit of technology. Uh, so the details are in this paper. It's a paper with uh, Fabio Apruzzi, Federico Bonetti, Sagar, and Sakura Shefer Nameki. Um, and the whole point I want to make is that you can do this calculation. Basically, plug this in and expand. It's essentially a cubic term, so it's going to be a factor of three. And schematically, after the dust settles, you get something that hopefully looks reasonable. You get an integral over m m8, some eight-dimensional spacetime, of d gamma cap b2 squared. <coughs> times minus one half integral minus three mod z n of t1 cap uh, t1 cap beta t1 and there's a box there okay so that's what you get from the expansion hopefully it's reasonable uh, yes am i inputting that back in and pick the uh, terms of the right dimension the only thing that perhaps is not apparent is that one of the b's that appear here in writing dc3 as g4 becomes a box thing. That's the right analysis. Okay, so you end up with a calculus with a calculation supergravity where you have essentially a Chern Simons, the classical Chern Simons invariant here for a lens space, and there you have the instant number. The magical thing that happens is that these two things agree and they agree for every gauge group, and so on. It's a really a beautiful calculation. Um, and with this, I'm going to finish, but I have a very important thing to say, which is, in the last lecture, I really want to thank the organizers, and I think we should thank the organizers because it's been a great school. So thank you for the work.